Welcome to Tips from Trestle. This podcast is dedicated to discussing the senior living industry with a unique focus on food, hospitality, and leadership. I'm your host, Aaron Fish. As a 25-year veteran of the hospitality industry, I've focused my work on creating exceptional experiences for the customers we serve. My goal for this podcast? Educate, inform, and inspire leaders in senior living to bring food and hospitality to the front of mind in our industry. Let's bring the innovative and passionate spirit of hospitality to everything that we do. For the residents, families, guests, and employees we serve each and every day. So what are we waiting for? Let's get to it. Today on Tips from Trestle, I'm joined by Matt Perez. Southern California native Matt Perez has enjoyed a career that has taken him to some of the most sought after destinations in the world. He is currently the National Director of Dining Operations for MBK Senior Living. In his role, he supports and leads the dining strategic direction for the company, additionally supporting each community culinary and service programs to create a best-in-class resident experience. Matt's prior roles included VP of Hospitality at Vineyard Luxury Communities, National Director of Dining at Kisco Senior Living, Principal of Fork Fusion Consultants, and Executive Chef Partner at TS Restaurants. Matt was educated at the highly regarded Culinary Institute of America at Greystone in Napa Valley, and over the years has honed his skills working with some of the country's best-known restaurateurs, including Chris Costantino, Jordan Kahn, and Adam Fleischman. While in Hawaii, Matt had the privilege also of serving under Hawaii Regional Cuisine founder, Peter Merriman. Matt, thank you for joining me today on Tips from Trestle. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. So tell us a little bit about your journey getting into senior living. You know, I think your background is somewhat similar to mine in that uh, I started out kind of in the commercial hospitality. I was in hotels versus restaurants, but otherwise, you know, our backgrounds are very similar as how we got here, I'm guessing. But I'm curious about your journey to senior living from the restaurant world. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, I have to admit it, it kind of happened by accident. Um, you know, after a long duration of time uh, as an executive chef and, and as a partner with uh, TS Restaurants, I had um, gotten out of that role thinking I wanted to do something different and uh, started a consulting company. And I call it kind of my, my tweener projects that I was working on. It was what I was working on between what I found, what I truly love to do. And uh, I remember it, Aaron, almost vividly because um, I decided, okay, I got to get out of hospitality um, consulting and head towards something a little bit different. I was really after quality of life, was after a um, little less travel and candidly a little less stress. And um, I was very fortunate. I had some job offers from, from some great companies. And um, I still giggle to this day because, you know, I had uh, a few callbacks with uh, Kisco Senior Living at the, at the time. And uh, I, I, there was something about it, Aaron, like it was in the culture. It was everybody who I met and spoke to. There was this warm feeling of hospitality, just really great environment, smart people doing some compelling, meaningful work. And uh, it was attractive. And, um, you know, the reason I giggle is because it scared the crap out of me. I knew nothing about it. Right. I was like the easy path was, you know, to kind of be a VP of hospitality again at a restaurant group. That was kind of the natural path. But um, I chose the scary path and uh, it was an amazing thing. Um, I had, you know, obviously some learning to do in the healthcare side of things, but um, it was a wonderful opportunity to get into an environment where I could participate and contribute to that meaningful work and, uh, and get some of that quality of life that I was after. Yeah. It's funny that you say you stumbled across it on accident because that is literally kind of how I start every time my story. Sure. No, because sure. I got engaged and needed to move closer to my fiance and wound up working at a large CCRC as a dining room manager, coming from a hotel food and beverage manager. So it was a it was not at all what I had planned on doing, but then really luck of the draw got good opportunities to to really grow in the in the role and learn about senior living. So I always think that's it's interesting that. I don't think that people with our backgrounds choose it intentionally, but when we get in, we find that 
what we do is so important for, for senior living, you know, and that's one of the reasons, you know, I think we connected was kind of our, our shared passion about hospitality and how mm-hmm. valuable it is in senior living. Cause you know, when it seems to me like every day, you know, I read everybody talking about, you know, we're always talking about driving senses, we're talking about, you know, what do we do with staffing? And there's always all this talk about healthcare. But, you know, I believe that that third pillar for senior living is hospitality and it solves and bridges the gap for all of those other things. And so um, what was your journey like bringing hospitality into the senior living, bringing your background and using it to kind of elevate, and create um, in the organizations you worked with? Yeah, great question. I love it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I got to admit, you know, it. it kind of the initial phase, it was met with some resistance, right? A little bit of disruption. And, um, you know, I think a lot of providers in senior living can can attest to sometimes change is very difficult. And um, we have by, for no good reason, I think we've gotten stuck in our ways. And, um, you know, it can be a difficult business related to dining in terms of that necessary disruption. So, you know, I think the most important part that I did, Aaron, was come in and listen and learn and understand really where the challenges were and where the areas for growth could be. And um, for me, it was about building relationships and and really building this this trust element. And then once I had that, it became much easier for me to work with these directors of dining services to help them understand that hospitality is a feeling. It's not a task. It's not something that you ultimately put on a checklist and you check it and you're done. you know, I've, I've, I've got these little Matt Perez isms, I call them, you know, and, you know, you get in an elevator and somebody asks you, can you define hospitality? What does it mean to you? And, um, you know, for me, by and large, hospitality is about a feeling. It's about how we leave others feeling from an experience. And, you know, those were my motivators. I think, you know, with senior leadership at first, it was new. It was different it was perceived as a challenge. Like, oh, how are we going to accomplish that within our per resident day labor budgets? Right. And, uh, you know, I've always been a fan of, well, let me show you before I ask you really to get on board. Let's look at it. Let's look at an example A and an example B of current operations versus something that we can deploy and roll out that has got this, this, this resonating oozing goodness around hospitality. And, um, you know, that, that was kind of the journey portion of it. And the pushback part, I think, you know, kind of had a way to, to slide out after they observed it and saw come, some of the merits. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we were successful um, in accomplishing was understanding we didn't have all the answers related to bringing hospitality into senior living operations. And at Kisco, we went on discovery and we said, who out there does it the best? Right. So we got in our little focus group settings and we all told our stories of wonderful hospitality we received at the Ritz Carlton's Four Seasons of the World. Right. Right. And uh, the common thread always came back to a certification. It was around some checklist and some some, you know, what I'll call kind of guided information from a third party. And uh, Forbes travel guide is what distilled in terms of what resonated with us. And, um, you know, Forbes at the time was not, and I don't think they still are doing any certifications in senior living, but they've got some great material that help you understand the difference between service and hospitality that goodness that I talked about earlier that really creates that environment of hospitality and that feeling that you heard me mention. So even though, you know, the pushback was, was off the cuff um, initially, I think that the business leaders, ownership, and senior executive management at Kisco realized early on that this could truly be a differentiator for us if we were trying to be the best in the markets we serve. Yeah, no, I I love the way you phrase it about it being a feeling, right? Because I don't think people really like get their head or their arms around that. You know, I know that when I would walk into one of those uh, opportunities where I was a, a national director or, or a senior VP. I always went to the low hanging fruit to get buy-in, right? I'd be like, well, you're missing this process. You're missing this thing. And I would want to fix the nuts and bolts underlying. But I, my whole goal for doing that was 
as I did that, it was every process always had a little bit of extra hospitality on it, right? So we're going to do this training, but we're going to talk about the customer service component. And we're going to train on this as to why this is valuable for someone to be a better server or to provide a better experience um, because the process is everybody's got a checklist, right? And that's not really the, the function, I mean, or the, the form behind it. And getting people to buy into that, that feeling of hospitality can be really hard sometimes. Mm-hmm. Agreed. You know, you, you kind of stirred a thought in me too um, about, you know, these days leadership is about, you know, Simon Sinek videos and, you know, emotional intelligence. And there's so much material out there now for us to get pumped up on things. And, um, you know, I think leadership has, um, now it's got the leadership tagline that goes with it. But, you know, you and I both have probably worked for some great leaders that embodied hospitality. And it makes me think about this story, um, you know, kind of back to while I was at Kisco Senior Living, our chief operations officer, her name's Terry Novak. And um, again, I was listening and learning new into senior living. So there was a lot of things that impressed me. And, um, you know, she was obviously the operations leader for the company. And there was something she did, Aaron, that really resonated with me from a leadership standpoint. Um, and it was a small thing. And, and I didn't notice it at first, but it was something that really made me feel great when I walked into her office. And it was something as simple as no matter what she was working on, if I knocked on the door and said, hey, Terry, do you got a minute for a question? She would stop what she's doing and she would stand up and she would greet me. And it sounds so small, but I think that hospitality approach in leadership is so important that as we get out into communities and we're, we're vying for support and we want folks to come on the journey with us as we're facilitating and, and creating some tutorials, it's about how we carry ourselves, the cadence at which we speak. And I don't want to oversimplify it, but it does come down to somewhat of your leadership qualities to be able to really get it out there. Yeah, no, that's a great story, right? Because it, it, what she did was set that tone of uh, this interaction, which is really what we do with hospitality, right? Is all about, it's senior living in general, right? It's about a person to person interaction. And it's, I value whatever's about to happen. It needs to be the number one priority, right? Even though she could have, maybe she was writing an email to one of her family members, or it could have been, she was working on a year end financial report for investors, which probably was a very high priority. But right. you had no idea which value right. level that was because she paused, right. she made that moment important. And that's what I think it's about, right? Is how do we create those moments, those little tiny experiences so they build day in and day out uh, over the course of you know an hour, or two hours, weeks and months even. Yes. So. Yeah, agreed. And then I think too, you know, to, to unpack that a little further, you know, because I think um, the constant challenge of yourself of how do you do things a little better, right? How do you, how do you really inspire and lead um, to disrupt and, and to get people to come along with you? And um, it makes me think about when I'm in community and I'm doing these work, work groups and workshops, um, the hospitality element, and, and that's why I love that both you and I are in alignment around the way it makes you feel, right? Because you and I both have attended some trainings where it was a facilitator in the front room and they were articulating what we were supposed to be learning and it was just done very systematically and it's hard to stay engaged. Right. Yep. And um, I'm sure both you and I and, and folks listening have been a part of uh, that experience when it was from a place of hospitality. And we were like on the edge of our seat waiting to listen to what the next learning, learning um, subject matter was. So in community, it's about, you know, where are we doing the training? Is it in the restaurant? Who's there? Um, do we create an environment of productivity and excellence? All these little small um, factors, I think, help us to drive this meaningfulness around hospitality. You know, again, back to what I said, it's like the way you facilitate how you carry yourself, but also creating that environment for people to be their very best is anticipating their needs, right? I mean, we've yeah. going to a meeting and seeing um, a hospitality station with hydration, coffee, and juice, and tea already set up and maybe a little um, bite to eat, um, a pad of paper and a pen. I mean, these are small little things, but it's anticipating needs really helps to lean itself to the, uh, to the productivity piece. Yeah, no, it, the anticipating needs piece is so important to, to mention, right? Because, I mean, that's how you put that like bow on hospitality, right? Because you can do customer service where I approach you and say, 
I need X and you say, yes, sir, let me get you X. And then you get me X. And then I mean, it's a good transaction, right? Like I, I asked you for something, you gave it to me. And that was just exactly what was needed, right? The service process was completed, but anticipating that and kind of knowing, okay, well, uh, well, Aaron has been here before. I know he's going to ask me for X. So maybe I should get it ready or knowing that, uh, you know, whatever the resident, you know, I, I always battle that, that, that idea of, you know, the, the pre-setting things for residents, right? Because it speaks a little bit to, I want to anticipate their need, but you want to still have that personal connection and that personal touch point to it. And I think the combination of the two really can drive home what we do um, in senior living. And I, yeah. I do think the other piece of the puzzle is <laughs> when we talk about all of these things around hospitality, a lot of times people go to think to that like luxury model of senior living, you know, the $5,000 a month and we're doing linens and all of that. There's plenty of people in our, in our industry that aren't doing that, but still can bring great customer service because they're anticipating the need of that resident who isn't in that luxury model, but they still have something and they need to be served. Yes, indeed. Indeed. I think you and I have talked about this, but I've got this whimsical example of, um, you know, where I'm facilitating and and doing some trainings and stuff and, you know, ask the learners in the group, I'm like, you know, what's your definition of fine dining? And everybody articulates it much like you just did, right? I mean, it's beautiful plateware, it's tablecloths, it's um, a a beautiful environment. And I shock the crowd pretty much every time when I say, well, in my interpretation, I think in and out hamburgers fine dining. And they push back in their chair and they go, interesting. I've never heard that before. Please do tell more, right? And, you know, senior living, we have kind of got this, this thing going on that we have to debunk a little bit that we're, we're trying to be fine dining. Mm. in and out hamburger, I mean, I don't know about you, Aaron, but I've never been to one where I found trash in the parking lot, right? I've never been to one where their, their, their greeters weren't there and they were walking around picking up trash and greeting you. Can I get you some more lemonade or whatever it was? Mm-hmm. It's always clean. The food always excellent. They very rarely make or, uh, errors. So again, fine dining for me isn't so much that it has to be um, fitting into this box of luxury. And moreover, back to the feeling. It's when you leave yep. the environment. I feel like that was a darn good burger. I felt like I was a hero. They, they treated me like I was royalty. I love that. Yeah. Um, and, and there was something I wanted to come back to this, this other cutesy little story. Um, you know, there's a movie I'm sure you've seen, Meet the Parents. Oh, yeah. And uh, thinking about transactional service versus hospitality, um, I played this little clip of the video where Ben Stiller's in the airport and he's waiting to board. And uh, there is, you know, no need to name the airlines representative in the front. Right. And she's there and he hands her the ticket and there's no one else in the airport. And she's saying, well, we're only boarding rows one through five and he's in a row six, but no one's there. <laughs> and he, he turns around and he looks and he's like, there's no one here. Right. And, you know, if you if you were to audit her, Aaron, on a checklist from that airlines, from a service standpoint, she smiled, she made greeting contact, she she filled in all of those checklists on what is great service. But hospitality missed the mark. Right. Yeah. So, um, again, it's funny. Yeah, because both of those examples, it's really, you know, the devil's in the details of mm-hmm. all of this. And it's understanding what you do and what you provide. I One of the things that always strikes me is watching kind of the evolution right because when i got into senior living you know that's really what everybody was trying to do was transition from this institutional model to a a hospitality service model i mean that was one of the reasons i was fortunate enough to get my first director role was because we transitioned from a management company to self-op and that first director they hired was an institutional had institutional background schools and hospitals and you know very buttoned up on the back end and numbers and all of that but the feeling and the food and all of the little things that needed to happen for these residents in a high-end senior living weren't happening weren't being executed so I you know I got that opportunity but I what I learned as I got that job and then transitioned further in my career is that Everybody rushed to do that, and that's what everybody wanted to sell. That wasn't necessarily what everybody wanted to buy, especially with the changing demographics that we're dealing with. Like, not everybody wants that 
fine dining, you know, high end China white tablecloth experience. Sometimes they want to be able to go, like you said, and just have a really great burger in a really great setting. Mm hmm. Agreed. Agreed. And like <clears throat> I call it segmentation, right? I mean, we have different um, residents in most all of our communities, but, you know, we're in alignment. I think that whether it be in our restaurants and senior living or us getting our oil changed or fill in the blank example, we all just want to feel special. And when we as providers can make our customers feel special, that's our residents, their families. Shucks, if it's the guy who breaks down in front of our community and gets a flat tire, hospitality kicks in, we go out, we help them change the tire or let them use the phone kind of thing. And we bring them a cold beverage if it's hot outside. Um, you know, th those, those little elements I think are the keys to success is truly creating those environments that are warm, secure, they're friendly. Um, and we're, you know, I, again, one of these little Matt Perez isms is I, um, you know, talking about hospitality and deploying the training is look for opportunities to blow people away. Meeting expectations, it's just necessary. That's any, anything in business or, or anything else. Meeting expectations is required. But if we all set out and look for opportunities to blow someone away, that's a big difference. Yep. Um, that's back to that feeling of hospitality. They're going to leave that, um, that environment or that experience feeling really, really charged up about what just happened. Absolutely. Excuse me. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit, um, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with what MPK is doing, um, but being that you're mostly in California and I'm not, um, mm -hmm. give us a, a couple of examples of the kinds of things you guys are doing uh, along those lines to, to really drive that hospitality mindset forward. Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things we're doing is largely around the deployment of training. And um, we're using a couple of verticals I think are, are, are really unique. Um, first one being, and before I dive into it, I want to kind of explain the why and the background behind this, right? So um, every leader, um, yourself, me, anybody else who's listening, um, I'm sure we're always thinking to ourselves, how do we do it better? What, what are we missing? How do we um, resonate with our audience more and more and more? And, um, you know, I think this is pretty intuitive, but the folks we're hiring, they're young, they're millennials. And the way they receive training is so much different probably than the way you and I receive it and or prefer to receive it. Yep. Um, we've got this culture of um, team members who prefer to introvert, watch it on YouTube, let me learn on my own. I'll ask you questions if I have them, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I realized this early on, we were, we were deploying, you know, focus group teams and we're going into communities. We're going, okay, everybody gather around and we're going to talk about a subject and we want you to get excited about it. And it was really hard to hold their attention. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, back into that, that retrospective thinking about it, I was like, you know what, there has to be a, a process or a method where we can celebrate this video learning. And uh, I met Greg, um, who is the uh, founder of Pineapple Academy. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't heard about it, it's, uh, it's web hosted. Think Netflix and YouTube meets college curriculum and yep. they show it in micro learning videos. And we've partnered with them and we're doing some proprietary content on our side and leveraging some stuff that they already have. And um, I think it's best deployed where, you know, we celebrate that technology um, piece the way they want to learn. So we'll get into an environment there and we'll let them pull out their cell phones while sitting in training. We'll have tablets around that they can use. And then we'll talk to a subject matter. And we'll say, okay, there's some videos we want you to watch. They're three and four minutes a piece. Go ahead and watch them at your convenience. And they're watching them on the device that they prefer at their own speed. And after that, we all kind of put the devices down. We're like, well, what do we learn? Let's get some takeaways. How are we going to implement this? Let's, um, and then we'll have a control setting. We'll set up a control table. And if it's pre-busing, we'll go over and we'll get some champions to pre-bust the table the right way. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I'm really proud about the Pineapple Academy partnership. And um, it's really helping us, I think, to deploy training in a way that our learners want to learn. Um, and then the other part is through our LMS. It's, it's again, a technology um, platform for them to learn everything from leadership, emotional intelligence, um, best practices within their job skills. So I guess the takeaway there is, um, you know, we, we have to be, um, we have to approach it differently. I think yeah. that, you know, we have a tendency sometimes to bring the papers 
right? And get in to do the trainings and get the checklist on the end services. And well, I think that's all very important. Um, you know, we, we have to move to this digital era of acceptance, right? And celebrate that with our frontline team members. And, you know, it's been, it's been pretty successful. I've been with MBK since, you know, fourth quarter of last year. And, um, you know, I think the culture of hospitality is definitely changing and it's about embracing that new style of deploying training. Yeah, no, I, it's funny you bring up Pineapple Academy. You know, they're one of our partners at Trestle Hospitality Concepts because of exactly what you described, the ability to give the, the current employee and meet them where they're at, right? You know, okay. I have uh, young boys and it is very much a, a whole different process of getting them engaged in things. And you're right. right. You know, it's right. How can they, how can they do what they need to do where they're comfortable? And, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the, let's all get together. Let's do a big training. Here's some handouts. Let's show and talk and do. And that's just, like you said, that's just not working as well for operators, I think is what some of the things you're doing. And you really, I like the idea of meeting them where they're at. So love those takeaways. So um, we've only got a few more minutes, but one of the sure. things I did want to make sure, and we're kind of shifting gears a little bit, but you are uh, a, a sustainability uh, devotee, if you will. Um, it's one of the things you're passionate about uh, as well as hospitality. And so I was just curious if you could kind of talk through a little bit of the, the what, what could we be looking at, some things that are important with, with operators on sustainability. I want to touch on that at least a little bit before we wrap up. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so yes, absolutely. Sustainability has been um, a passion of mine for a number of years. And I think it started, Aaron, when, you know, I was chefing it up, I call it. And, you know, I, I really thought to myself, we are stewards as, as culinarians, right? We're, we're using a lot of resources. And I think that um, most people know that in, in a restaurant, we're over consumers. We consume water to um, defrost fish or protein, we are using disposables probably more than most. And um, I really embrace that challenge as a steward to understand um, the impacts of sustainability and being mindful thereof from LED lights changing from fluorescence to operational improvements for standard operating procedures for how we defrosted that fish. Yeah. Um, training um, you know, the culinarians preps and, and cooks and things like that to be understood that, you know, much like we probably learned in culinary school, just zero waste. What can we do to reinvent things that we consider waste? Um, so much so that uh, I became kind of the, the sustainability point person for TS restaurants. Um, fortunate to win some awards and things like that, but that's not why I do it. I think that, you know, sustainability is something in an ever-changing world and it doesn't matter your political views or things like that. It's just the right thing to do. Yeah. And um, I look at it from a senior living lens of, if I can save a little bit over here, Aaron, from not using disposables and things like that, I can add that cost back into my experience for our residents and our PRDs. Yep. Um, you know, I tell this story where, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll go in for staff meal and I want to eat with the, the associates and, um, you know, not knowingly that the team will serve my meal in a disposable tray and hand it to me. And I look around and everyone's getting their meal in a, in a throwaway. And then we all take it into the break room, we eat, and then we all throw it in the trash. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's being mindful of those little things. But I think, you know, at a 30,000 foot level, it's, it's understanding our responsibility in championing things that, um, that, that restaurants, and I think hotels do pretty well. It's celebrating local, uh, using local vendors, um, trying to get a chef's garden on site and um, doing the five minute salad where everything in that dish comes from five minutes away. Yeah. Uh, you know, sustainability um, has been and kind of continues to be a buzzword, but I look at it as our operational responsibilities to um, minimizing really what we're doing um, from a procurement standpoint, because that's a large part of it too. Yeah, no, and, you know, one of the things that I think is so valuable in what all you're saying is that it kind of comes back to what we've been talking about this whole day, right? Uh, hospitality is a feeling, right? And so, you do these sustainability, you know, initiatives, the feeling around that is going to be a positive one. You're making an impact, you're affecting the bottom line, you're leaving the place uh, better than you found it. And so um, there's probably a whole nother conversation that we could have around sustainability. So 
I'm going to make a mental note to get you back to talk <laughs> about that as a deep dive. <laughs> agreed, so, agreed, um, agreed. Perfect. Well, hey, Matt, we're, our, we're right at time here. And so I appreciate all your time. Um, it's for me, it's always great to find, you know, kindred spirits, especially in our industry where we're talking about why hospitality is so important. So thank you for coming on and, and sharing a little bit of your story and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll keep watching it. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Really appreciate the time. Yes. Thank you, Matt. So there you have it. Another one in the books. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. You can follow or direct message me on LinkedIn, where I'm always commenting and posting about food, hospitality, and leadership for the senior living industry. Or give me a follow on Twitter at AHFish or Instagram at Aaron H. Fish. And check out my company, Trestle Hospitality Concepts, at www.trestlehospitalityconcepts.com. I'm your host, Aaron Fish, and this has been another episode of Tips from Trestle.